I think we're on and uh, it says we're live again. And if I have a delay, I apologize. Um, now it says you're good. So we're live, we're good. All right, my contact told me we're live and we're good. Sorry for that confusion and that delay. Uh, we're about 10 minutes off, so I guess I have to get started again. I want to remind you of our actual hours. Now our driving tour, which is available now at $10 uh, for uh, a non-member, $8 for a member is available five day, four days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, and Saturday and Sunday actually through and our gift shop. But we are actually open to the public Friday, Saturday and Sunday, 11 to five. I'd like to uh, mention to you as well that uh, our next speaker is Stephanie Winsick on October 27th talking about eerie ghost stories. And, but our speaker tonight, I will get right to because of the, we're behind a little bit, but we'll go as long as we need to. Becky Weiser is the curator here at the Hagen History Center, and I did not introduce myself, but I'm Jeff Sherry. I'm the museum educator here at the Hagen History Center, and Becky is in a complicated process of deaccessioning a lot of things from the collection. So Becky is going to talk about it rather than me give you a long definition and repeating what she might say. So let me turn it over to our curator, Becky Weiser. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate this opportunity uh, to talk about what I've been doing for the past three years. And all of this is gearing up for an auction that we're having October 15th, which is Thursday next week at Plus Auction House in Quarry. And to part with things in, the, in a museum collection is not an easy process because we have so many things. Right now I have about 14,000 things in our database. And we are going to, at this particular auction, sell approximately 600. And that's just the tip of a very large iceberg. For the past three years, my team, which is Amanda Rockwood, uh, curatorial assistant, I've had college interns and many, many wonderful volunteers, love you all, that have looked at every single thing that's been in our possession. And we are, deaccessioning de or getting rid of objects. And it started when I began my employment at the Heinz, Heinz Hagen History Center because the board flat out said, we can't afford to keep all of these things. We had 10,000 square feet of offsite storage, boxes, taller than me, piled up with things, furniture on top of each other. And I do have some images that I wanted to share with you if you haven't already seen them. So I'm gonna bring up a little presentation that I've come up with and hopefully it will pop up and hang on a minute, everyone. Let's see where it is. There it is. So we're gonna start here from the beginning. Okay, and we can see too much. There we go. Ah. All right, I'm just gonna show you a couple pictures here and I think you're gonna see all of my slides, but eh, we're gonna roll with it right now. So you can see the boxes piled up. Um, everything was disordered. When I started here, Jeff and I in particular were working on an exhibit on World War II. And we were trying to find objects for this, ah, for this exhibit. And we had no luck because they had a spreadsheet with all of these boxes and it said, hey, look in box 138, you're gonna find a World War II uniform. We go to box 138, go through it, no uniform. And that happened over and over again. So this system was definitely not working for us. We could tell. Just to show you. Yes. You slide on my screen is the Hagen History Center. I don't know if you can. Oh, no, mine is not. Okay. Tell her to change, uh, Shelby, our technical director, said tell her to change the slide. <laughs> I am. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what's can going on. Can you advance on. the slide? Yeah, I'm working on it. Funny, we've done this so many times now. Start slideshow. It's not working. I'm just going to go back to me, if that's okay. And we're going to skip all of this. Well, I'll explain it. You have quite a few slides. I mean, but you can't advance them. 
It's not allowing me to, and I don't know why. Can you, can our technical person see me again? Or just my... Uh... Um, I think we see the Hagen History Center. Still. Why don't you go ahead? We probably should go. Okay. So with all of this, and I'll try to bring up, again, I can see my pictures. I'm sorry you can't, because it's just showing piles and piles of things all over the place. So, and I'm trying to get to those pictures that you can see maybe. No, it's not allowing me to, really. I think I've had it enough times up here. No. Okay, let's do this. Okay. Well, I apologize. This is uh, not working. It's just dead in the water right now. Well, go ahead, Becky, and tell us what's happening. Okay. And so, we have a couple of questions coming in already. So. Oh, good, good. And maybe I can answer them before it hits. I'm sorry you have to see just my initial screen. But everything was boxed up, 10,000 square feet, couldn't find a, a thing. So we knew we had a problem. And how did we get to this problem? How, how did this happen? Well, quite simply, it happened because we, would take, we became grandma's attic. Grandma died, everything in the attic is terrific. No one in the family wanted it. So they would give it to us and we would say, sure, we'll take it. And that happened over and over again. Also, things got moved multiple times. We had different storage facilities. So we had things that were being broken. We had things that were losing their catalog numbers. So we didn't even know where these objects came from anymore. And it became a serious problem with just too, too many things. So I had to change how we operated as a museum. In Becky, can I interrupt you for just a brief second? I'll make this the last technical interruption. Uh, <laughs> we're told, tell you to stop sharing, then okay. share again. Okay. I stop sharing. Do we see me? Yep. Now Correct. we need you to share again. Okay. And it's not even up. Okay. Let me find it, and here it is. Okay. And? And you've got to share the whole screen on your PowerPoint. This is from our technical graphic. <laughs> Do we see that now? Do we see? And you go to Slideshow. Slideshow view show uh, from beginning. It's not allowing me. Hold it. There it is. Yay. I, I see what we, I think we need to see. Okay. Me tell, okay. I'm sorry for it. Paul, apologize <laughs> to everyone in viewing land. <laughs> I'm uh, a The 18 or so people <laughs> that were watching, which at last count. So <laughs> Becky, I'm sorry. Please. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Here are all those boxes I was telling everybody about in our offsite storage on State Street. 10,000 square feet piled up. As you can see, wonderful piles of furniture. And you're looking at this furniture going, why? Why is it here? We didn't know why. Uh, a lot of it was just ordinary objects. So what we would do is with my staff is we looked at every single thing in this collection. And in this picture in particular, you can see we've got some Kohler brewing boxes that are really important to Erie history. Um, and below that, you've got some statues and a basket, just a regular ordinary basket. And it looks like some pieces of wood and some random crates at the bottom shelf. And that was how things were organized. You couldn't find anything. We just had a variety of stuff. So we looked at every single thing one at a time looked for the number. And then what we could do is we go back to the original, what they call the accession. So to accession is to take something into the collection and try to find out what's the story behind this. Maybe somebody bought this statue and, or maybe, and it was produced here in Erie 
and it was at the public library on exhibit. We don't know. So we would look at everything and find out why it's here. So something that we do here at the Erie County Historical Society Hagen History Center is everyone has to fill in when they give something to us, a deed of gift. And this is a legal document saying this object now is in our possession. And, and if you can read the fine print there, which is probably difficult to see, we can do whatever we want with it. Now, in the past, the policy for museums was if Jeff gave me, let's say something, a piece of a mouse, a computer mouse, and he gave it to me five years ago, and I filled out this deed of gift, I would have to officially go back to Jeff, find him after five years and say, Jeff, do you want this mouse back? Well, that's easy to do because he just gave it to me five years ago, but we've been collecting in this organization since 1898. So the chances of me finding someone or an heir of someone who donated an object is impossible or it was impossible. Therefore, we never got rid of anything. So what the board agreed to do, thankfully, is to take that step out and all museums are doing this now because almost all museums are just bursting at the seams with too many things and a lot of it that's not pertinent to their mission. And our mission here at the Erie County Historical Society Hagen History Center is to collect objects that are pertinent to our regional history. So that's with that change it allowed us to move forward with this process. Here I've got a picture of some of my staff on Thursday nights. Uh, every Thursday evening we would go to offsite storage and as you can see Linda here wearing the raspberry blouse is on a computer and so is Barry across the way. So we would check to go back to these original records which are all digitized and we would check perhaps in other sources too. We would Google things, eBay things, any kind of information we can find on a particular object. And then Brian in the very, very back is taking pictures of things. Uh, we keep everything in a database and we keep visual pictures or records of everything that we've got. And here is Amanda and she is on our sixth street works area and this is called the mezzanine it's back in our archive building and she has a little photography studio behind her and that's her area and she's working with someone in the blue you can just see their arm so we before the pandemic we'd always had a nice uh, staff grouping of people that would work together looking at every single thing and we've looked at over 14,000 things in three years and then i have university students and these two guys <laughs> worked with me last summer and that beautiful couch that they're on, we are saving because it is a spectacular piece. But these folks um, are students and we work with a lot of university students to help them get experience in the museum world, to help discern if this is something they want to study. And this is, they're all part of this process as well. So I mentioned how we're keeping things now. And I have this example of my database, which is called Past Perfect. A lot of museums use this. And it gives you a lot of information here about things that we're keeping. So we have the picture, of course, of this particular box. We give the story of the particular box. And then the best part of our whole system is that we have a home location so that we can find, if you look, and it's like in the middle of this page. So our goal, and it's worked, is within 10 minutes, if Jeff says to me, hey, I want that box because I've got a group of people that are studying um, boxes that were used for christening ships, within 10 minutes, I can have this in his hands. And that's our goal. We wanna be able to help researchers. We want to be able to uh, assistant educational programming, and we want to store things in perpetuity. So we need to find things um, for exhibits as well. So that's what this is about. And then the next step that I've taken beyond this is the barcoding. 
what we're doing is we're using modern warehouse technology now in a museum setting. Now, this is not what the public sees at all, but these are for objects that we're keeping and we have container barcodes and every object has a barcode. So truly I can go along with a tablet or a laptop and a scanner. I don't even have to open the box and I can see exactly what's in that box. So it's, it expedites things quite a bit. So this has all happened in the past three years here. We're very, very professional now in how we handle things. And another big thing that I've done is in the past, we would have something called the Jeff collection. And you're going, well, yeah, that's great. He donated all these things. W what does that mean? <laughs> and nobody knew what that meant. So now if he donated a piece of Griswold, it goes in the Griswold collection. If he donated a military uniform, that goes in the uniform collection. And if he donated a cup, that might go in household goods. And so that way we're grouping like things together which makes to me a whole lot more sense in what we're trying to do. And for example, the picture you see here, this slide is a part of our Griswold collection. So we have all of it together, everything is barcoded and it's, it all is organized and makes sense. These things we're keeping. Things that fall outside of this, we're not. Here's an example, I just want you to Look at this, this was on our blog yesterday, this particular object. And you might look at this and go, oh, you know, I have no idea what that is. Or maybe you missed that blog yesterday, but yesterday was cranberry day here in Erie. And it was a big deal because they harvested cranberries on, that grew in the bogs on the Presque Isle. And this happened in the 1800s until they picked all the cranberries out, sadly. So this particular object is a cranberry picker. And we have this, I was able to find it instantly for the blog. And so that picture was available. So these are the kinds of things we do. Also, not that I uh, have a favorite or anything, but the Griswold collection, we have over 700 pieces in this. We really like this collection. It was made here in Erie and they're all different, but now, the reason I can collect this for the museum is that I know what I have and I'm able to go and see, do I want this heart and star waffle iron? Well, let's see what we've got. So I'm able to be very selective in our collecting for the future because this is all about keeping objects relevant to our history for the future of our community. And then I've got a great little story to tell about something else new that we are uh, working on is this particular painting was just donated a couple of months ago and it's Judah Colt Spencer and Judah Colt Spencer was a big name in in Erie and the development of the land here and these paintings came from a family member again he's downsizing doesn't have room for these doesn't want them but I don't know if you can tell, if you look, he's got some white on his jacket, not his shirt, but below it. And what that is happening is there's a, a mold that's growing between the glass and the painting. So when the gentleman came to donate these paintings, he laid them down. I thought, oh boy, because um, this is going to take some money to get them fixed. And right now, you know, money is tight for, you know, for a lot of nonprofits and the Hagen History Center is, is no exception. But fortunately, in talking to the donor, he said that he was willing to um, pay for the conservation of these paintings, uh, due to Colt and his wife, Lavinia, they both had portraits. And so that's what he's done, is that he will pay for us to keep these paintings in perpetuity. And not only are they paintings of very significant eerie people, but the artist is significant because it's a Moses Billings and he was the, foremost portrait painter in Erie County in the mid 1800s. So we were lucky on all three levels. And so currently the paintings are at the Art Conservator in Cleveland and she will be starting to work on those soon. And we're really excited about that. But these are the kinds of things that we wanna keep, not the boxes and boxes, just the miscellaneous stuff. And at the auction next week, you're gonna see a lot of objects that are nice and really great things, 
but they don't fit our mission here. And we can't continue to keep all of these things. So that's what we're trying to do here. I think we, this, like I said, this is only the first auction of two or maybe three, depending on how quickly we can get through all of these things. But it's been an exciting process, progress, process here. And we're making a lot of progress um, with this whole thing. So I'm gonna get out of this show and hopefully get back to us. Yeah, here we are. Uh, so at this point, Jeff, did you have any questions? You're, you're muted, Jeff, I can't, okay. Okay. Yep. A viewer would like to know, are there any items from Albion or the West County in the auction? That's a good question. Uh, we do have some objects from probably the, the Battles Collection. The Battles Collection is very extensive. We have not only the White House in Girard that is full of objects, the Yellow House in Girard has many, many, many objects. And the overflow was brought here to Erie a number of years ago. So some things will be in the auction that are here, um, but they are not significant objects. Uh, I found out with the battles through years of looking at this collection that uh, they collect, they saved everything. Uh, they didn't get rid of anything when they bought something new. So we have a lot of side chairs uh, from that some trunks, not too many. Oh, some luggage probably from the 1960s that will be there, um, but nothing significant. The important objects to Erie County, we are keeping here, um, not just the ordinary stuff. Okay, another question. Will there be a complete list of items being sold? And I know the answer to that, so go ahead. Okay, the complete list will be up on Friday, or at least a fairly complete list. They're going to be giving pictures of all the objects Friday on the PLOS auction website. And then they also realize that not everyone can attend in Cory, So they will be taking absentee bids for objects. So if you see a, a chair that you're interested in, you can call them in advance, tell them you would like to put a bid on that chair and they will keep that in their records during the auction. I know some people have asked me, you know, why we're not doing a live internet bidding um, for this auction. And it was for a couple of different reasons. Number one, the percentage that the auctioneer would take from the historical society would go up significantly. And number two, most of the objects that are being sent to the auction are not pristine condition. They're not significant objects per se. I'm not saying that they're not nice, they are, but they're, we're not expecting to make $100,000 at this auction, but there are many, many nice things. And in particular, if you are talented in furniture refinishing or painting or upholstering, or if you just wanna you know, re repurpose the objects, it's a great opportunity to pick up things, I think, at decent prices. Okay, well, at this point, I don't have any other questions, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your assistant, Amanda, you have one paid assistant, and you have how many volunteers? You've had an army of volunteers I over the have. last couple of years. Tell us about them and tell me oh, the things they've done. These folks have been tremendous. I started here in September of 2017 as an employee and at the, the beginning of September. And by the end of September, I had my first volunteers and that's Kevin Thomas and then his wife Beverly joined us and then Jim Brown. So these folks have been with me almost the whole time. I've had roughly 30 volunteers helping me with this process and the enthusiasm level that they brought to the project has really helped Amanda and myself because, you know, looking at things and then every day deciding, and it's tough at the beginning. It's almost like who goes to the, uh, 
the gallows and who doesn't. I mean, it's not that bad, but you're looking at so many things sometimes that the decisions get heavy on you. I would make the final decision on every object, but they would make recommendations in their research because they would look at the accession records back when they, these things were given. They would research Erie County history things like, does this company really exist here in town and or in the county or all kinds of things they would always be researching. Bob O'Rear is another one of my fabulous researchers who just dove in to a lot of the military things that we have and we have a lot. And he was so helpful in finding more information about maybe a particular soldier that was from Erie County who fought in the Civil War or World War I and bring those stories more to life. Uh, Bob was instrumental in finding a big box one day of World, not World War I, Red Cross uniforms. Okay, and he, we probably have a finer collection of Red Cross uniforms than the Red Cross Museum of Washington, D.C. in his research. We have so many varied uniforms. So we're finding so many treasures as we've gone through this process. And the gowns, the Gilded Age silk, gorgeous gowns from 1880s, 1890s, these poor things have been abused in so many ways through the years. And now everything is stored properly with acid-free tissue in acid-free boxes, only a few, you know, a gown or two in a box. We're not squishing them together. Nothing's in plastic anymore. The goal is to keep things for perpetuity. And we should be proud of our history here and we should maintain our history. And that's what we're doing now. And it's really exciting. That's excellent, Becky. I will vouch for you, and then you don't need vouch for, but constantly working. And uh, I had started at the Historical Society a few months before you did. And when we went to State Street to look for artifacts for the World War II exhibit, it was the first time you'd seen it since you had volunteered back before, many years before. And I'll tell you, she cried when she saw the condition of these stacks and stacks and stacks of boxes and furniture, all these things that were in disarray. And it's amazing that the work that you and your staff, Amanda, and the volunteers have done in the past two and a half years. It really is. I've had a couple of times where actually I've asked Amanda, you weren't here for something that we needed for these little exhibits here and there. She immediately did exactly what you described checked the barcode, checked the computer, went and got it. I had it in my hand in about three minutes. Yeah. So that's what you're supposed to be able to do. I've learned uh, in a museum, you're supposed to be able to go find these things virtually immediately. Uh, we prefer if you make an appointment, but obviously to come see these. Uh, yeah. I tell yeah. Becky the story about stopping at the Hermitage in Nashville in New Jackson's home, where I knew they had an 1812 uniform coat I didn't call ahead and they looked at me sort of funny, but within 15 minutes, the coat was in front of me. They were very nice to be able to get this for the man with the strange accent. So yes, that's how it's supposed to work at the museum. And finally, think, we'll, yeah. it'll we've do really, that. We've raised our level of professionalism here. And that is due to the generosity, of course, of Mr. Hagen, but we have so many other donors uh, people that are not only have given objects, but have given money, given support of some way. And I could go on and on about multiple stories of things that were just forgotten about for so long, and now they're found, and now they're cared for. And so, yeah, we're, we're really on the way um, with our new buildings and all the excitement going on here. It's quite a bit. The class. construction here in just the three years since you and I have been involved, the, the growth, the new exhibits. And of course, no one anticipated the pandemic. We hope to be able to open um, in the spring of 2021, though, you know, we had hoped to open this spring as well. And of course, the pandemic prohibited that. So keep your eye out on our website. We try to add new things all the time to the website to keep it relevant, to keep you interested keep everybody interested. And um, if anybody has any other questions, I'd be glad to answer them. 
I would apologize to you again for the mistakes at the very beginning. We, it's the first time we have done this to Facebook, so it's something that we are learning. Hopefully the next time it will go smoother. Um, and we'll, again, our next speaker is Stephanie Winsick on Ghost Stories in Erie on October 27th at 7 p.m. I will mention a little bit more about the driving tour here. Our driving tour is a self-guided tour. You come and for the admission price, if you will, of $10, you get a copy of the book, Homeport Erie. And that's the title of the driving, driving tour. It cites around uh, Presque Isle Bay and the Bayfront and Presque Isle itself. $10 to a non-member, $8 for a member. So that is available Tuesday through Sunday here in our gift shop. Our public hours, however, are Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11 to 5. And I have no other questions listed here, Becky, so I will thank you very much for doing this, for being very patient with me, who is very nervous about doing it. And I thank all of you for your patience for watching. Thank you. You're welcome.